Okay, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Emma. I'm the recruitment manager here at the medical school at Swansea University. Thank you for joining us. I'm really pleased to say this evening that I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Anhara Davis. Um, Dr. Davis is our clinical associate professor, and she's going to be sharing tonight's uh, TASER lecture with you all on antimicrobial resistance. Now, those of you that are joining us live, we will have a Q&A at the end of the lecture so you can put your questions to Dr Davis. Those of you that are watching this on record just to say if you do have questions um, following this evening you can email us and the email address to use is study at swansea.acuk. Okay I will hand over to Dr Anhara Davis. Thank you Anhara. Hello everyone and thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I'm just going to share my slides now. Fabulous. Okay. Wonderful. There we are. Over to you. Thank you. So uh, it's great to get the opportunity to talk to you about antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance um, and some of my educational work around that. As you've heard, I'm a clinical associate professor here at the medical school in Swansea University, and I'm an honorary consultant medical microbiologist with Public Health Wales. And what that means is that my professional background is as a medical doctor specialising in microbiology and infection. I'm also the vice president of the body that sets our professional standards, which is the Royal College of Pathologists and a principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy. So antimicrobial resistance is an incredibly important topic and that's why I teach a module devoted to it in the Applied Medical Sciences and the Medical Pharmacology BSc courses. I also teach this to our medical students, our physician associate students, and I run a week-long course for healthcare professionals as well around this topic. So for the next 30 minutes or so, this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to hopefully give you a flavour of the subject matter that I teach and convince you why antimicrobial resistance is so incredibly important and, and introduce some general principles around the emergence of antimicrobial resistance and how it occurs. And then I'm going to uh, share with you some of the online resources I've developed to support students in Swansea in their studies and a brief flavour of some of my other professional activities and the student opportunities that are associated with those. So today is the anniversary of the first UK national lockdown. And since then, we've heard endlessly about the COVID-19 pandemic. But in the background, there's another slower pandemic going on, relatively silently, was nicely illustrated in this image from the Guardian newspaper just last month. And this other pandemic of antimicrobial resistance is attracting a lot less attention than COVID-19, but in the longer term, it has the potential to be uh, even more catastrophic for global health. Professor Dame Sally Davis, who was the UK's previous chief medical officer before Chris Whitty, is now the UK Global Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance and has done a lot of work in this field. And she last summer uh, conjured up this very memorable image. She said, COVID is a lobster dropped into hot water making a lot of noise as it expires. Whereas antimicrobial resistance is a lobster put into cold water, heating up slowly, not making any noise. So in other words, it's happening, but we're not really noticing it. In the past, uh, Dame Sally Davis has uh, compared the threat of antibiotic resistance to that of climate change. And there are many other scientists working in the field who, who agree with that assessment. So what exactly is antimicrobial resistance? Well, the World Health Organization uh, has defined it as uh, the ability of microbes to resist the effects of drugs. That is, they're not killed and their growth is not stopped. And it happens when microorganisms, which can be bacteria or fungi or viruses or parasites, when they change, when they're exposed to um, the drugs that work against them, uh, which are called antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals, 
and the various antiparasitic agents. And so they become ineffective and uh, persist in the body and also there's an increased risk of spreading to other people as well. Now back in 2019, which does seem like an age ago now because it was pre-COVID, uh, the World Health Organization listed its top 10 threats to global health. And six of those top 10 threats involved infection in one way or another. You can see that they listed a pandemic, although it was influenza that they anticipated rather than a coronavirus. Uh, vaccine hesitancy, which is also important in the current climate, um, and also antimicrobial resistance. So those were in the top 10 threats uh, uh, to global health, according to the World Health Organization. Back in 2014, the UK government commissioned Lord O'Neill to produce a report on antimicrobial resistance, and that re estimated that by 2050, there would be around 10 million deaths a year globally uh, from antimicrobial resistant infections, uh, which would overtake cancer as a cause of death. Uh, and that would be that would amount to a person every three seconds. So this is a really serious problem. Um, again, Professor Sally uh, Davis has also said that uh, antibiotic resistance could spell the end of modern medicine. Now that sounds very dramatic. Uh, let's, let's investigate exactly what she meant by that. So the first thing is, if we didn't have really effective antibiotics, we wouldn't be able to undertake what we think of as pretty routine surgery, like joint replacements and cataract surgery because uh, these are not life-threatening conditions and the risk of getting a, an infection, a really serious infection post-operatively would be too great to justify doing the surgery. So we could say goodbye to uh, routine uh, surgery like that. We certainly wouldn't be able to undertake risky procedures like bone marrow transplants, which we're using more and more in medicine now for serious medical conditions um, because um, bone marrow transplant is highly dependent on having uh, antibiotics to treat infections and the same for cancer chemotherapy. Uh, we wouldn't be able to successfully undertake that either if we couldn't treat infections properly. So if we couldn't do all these things then uh, it's true that modern medicine would be extremely different from how we currently know it. Let's go right back to the beginning of the story so that we can start to understand how this situation has arisen. It's actually less than 100 years since the discovery of the first antibiotic, which, as you probably know, was penicillin. And uh, Sir Alexander Fleming discovered that at St Mary's Hospital in London. And what he did was he, he went on his holidays one summer and left his bench in the lab in quite a mess. Apparently he wasn't a very tidy scientist and he left his petri dishes, his agar plates out in, in, the, in a sunny window. And while he was away, uh, all sorts of things started growing on these plates, including uh, various molds or fungi. And there are fungal spores everywhere in the environment. Uh, so it wouldn't be surprising that leaving your plates in, in the sun that this, this would happen. So when he came back from his holiday, this is what he noticed. This is the actual uh, agar plate or one of them that Alexander Fleming uh, noticed and you can see that at the top of the plate there's that big white blob and that is um, some fungus, some mould growing on the plate and at the bottom of the plate there are some smaller white blobs and those are the bacteria that he was trying to grow that he was experimenting on when he left his plates out and he noticed that near to the fungal growth that the um, bacteria couldn't grow nearly as well. You can see how the colonies of the bacteria near to the fungus are, are much smaller and more weedy. Now that mold was called penicillium. And so uh, Fleming postulated that it must be releasing something into the agar that was interfering with the growth of the bacteria. And he called that penicillin. So, um, Fleming wasn't the first person to ever have noticed this phenomenon. Uh, actually, the ancient Egyptians way back um, 1,500 years BC had uh, noticed that if you put mouldy bread on infected wounds, then that would help to um, cure infections. And this 
papyrus uh, details this and recommends the use of, of mouldy food for treating infections. And other more recent scientists had noticed this as well, like Pasteur, but nobody had really uh, investigated it. But uh, Fleming got two biochemists from Oxford called Florian Chain, uh, and he uh, got them to help him in extracting the active agent from the agar. And in 1945, Fleming and Flory and Chain won the Nobel Prize for their discovery of penicillin. And this is uh, Alexander Fleming receiving his Nobel Prize. Now, at that time, no one, everyone thought penicillin was fantastic. It, well, it was fantastic. It was a wonder drug at that time. But no one, not many people had really anticipated uh, what problems might arise next. But uh, Fleming himself, at his, uh, in his famous speech at that Nobel Prize ceremony uh, was one of the first people to anticipate uh, antimicrobial resistance and he said uh, you can read all this speech online if you're interested it's quite interesting but uh, part of what he said was I would like to sound one note of warning it's not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin in the laboratory there's the danger that the ignorant man may by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug make them resistant and uh, this was really um, showed uh, remarkable foresight by Fleming. And sure enough, that was in 1945. They'd started using penicillin in, in clinical practice in the early 1940s. And by 1947, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, which was one of the um, bacteria that they were using it to treat, uh, was uh, documented as being resistant to penicillin for the first time. And nowadays, around 95% of Staph aureus is resistant to penicillin, and we can't use it for that infection. Um, this uh, diagram, this graphic from Nature Reviews, uh, shows you um, a timeline. The orange line is a timeline. Uh, all the boxes above the timeline show when various antibiotics were developed and the boxes below the timeline shows when and when resistance was first documented to those antibiotics. And in general, it, um, over the years, experience has shown that within one to four years of introducing a new antibiotic, we have resistant strains appearing. Uh, here's another graphic from Clinical Infectious Diseases showing that uh, the development of new antibiotics is, is uh, in decline. So in the 1980s, there was a constant supply coming through of new antibiotics that we could use against resistant organisms. But by, uh, well, fewer than 10 years ago, uh, we, there were almost very few antibiotics coming through the pipeline. And there are a number of reasons for this. Um, that, that, that are quite complex, but the antibiotics are very expensive to develop and difficult to develop. And the developers know that once they have uh, brought a new antibiotic to market, uh, medics are going to try not to use it unless they're desperate because we try and preserve new agents. Um, if you add on to that, that people with infections are usually treated for a week or two um, or, or three, perhaps, uh, we try to reserve um, antibiotics and not use them as uh, too much. Um, so they're not really going to get their money back on the amount of money that it's cost to develop these new drugs. That's one reason. Um, and the Telegraph in 2019 estimated that there are only about 500 scientists in industry working on antimicrobial resistance around the world, whereas there are 3,500 working in Cancer Research UK alone. So this is really a neglected area of, of um, medicine and um, we really need more scientists working in, in this arena. An interesting development in 2019 as well from the Department of Health was a new to try and uh, combat this problem with the drug development pipeline and the lack of new antibiotics and the fact that it's not cost effective for the pharmaceutical companies to develop new antibiotics uh, is the, the NHS is going to try out a new method of, of paying for antibiotics. So it's going to be a sort of subscription uh, model where uh, drug companies agree to produce antibiotics and the NHS will pay them a fixed amount uh, regardless of how much of the antibiotics they actually use. 
because as I say, we try to reserve new antibiotics for uh, really resistant organisms. So it's going to be interesting to see how this uh, pans out. So what factors contribute to the development of antimicrobial resistance? Well, um, only last week, actually, this paper was published in JAMA uh, Open, uh, and this was an assessment of the use of antibiotics in hospitals in the United States. And they found that uh, in almost 56% of patients who received antibiotics in their study, uh, the use of them deviated from recommended practice. So one factor contributing to antimicrobial resistance is um, overuse and uh, misuse in medicine. Uh, and interestingly, we have data pretty similar to this American data from, from Wales, not, not, not that different. So that's interesting. But it's not only that, that's an oversimplification. There's plenty of other factors as well, and I'll list some of them now. Uh, infection control is important. So we need to prevent infections from spreading. That's also really important. Use of antibiotics in uh, veterinary medicine and animal husbandry and agriculture. Um, there's a lot of work going on of an, uh, about this at the moment to try and improve this situation. Uh, uh, there's a report online, the UK One Health Report that the government published in 2019. That's very interesting if you want to go and have a look. Um, and that found that only 64% of antibiotic use was in humans, even in 2017, and despite a lot of work that's been done on that. Uh, lack of laboratory capacity and tests too slow. And we've seen the, the um, crisis with lack of laboratory capacity over the last year with COVID-19. Um, we really need to be able to um, have much uh, faster uh, laboratory tests and investment in, in, in laboratory testing. Uh, not so much in the UK, but in some parts of the world, uh, the pharmaceuticals that are produced are not of very high quality, so the amount of active agent in the, in the preparations may not be as good as it ought to be. Uh, and there may not be very good control of the use of antibiotics. And for example, in some countries, you can buy antibiotics over the counter, although that's not the case in the UK. International travel, of course, as we've seen over the last year, uh, bacteria and viruses don't respect borders and they can spread across the world in hours uh, now that there's so much international travel by air. Medical tourism. Uh, you may have heard of people going to other countries to have to have their operation, for example, their hip replacement or their knee replacement or their cosmetic surgery. And uh, they can pick up uh, resistant organisms there and then bring them back um, with them. So that's sometimes a problem. And then probably underestimated uh, the spread of resistant strains due to poor sanitation and poor access to clean water. And uh, so this is also a public health issue. So it's a very complex picture, as you can see, and all these factors interact. And it's not a, a simple uh, issue at all. So for the next couple of minutes, let's look at what causes antimicrobial resistance biologically in bacteria. They could be resistant because they, they could be naturally resistant. That's called inherent resistant. Uh, and I'll explain each of these briefly in a minute. So they can be inherently resistant. They can undergo mutations or there can be gene transfer. So what do all those mean? So inherent resistance is where bacteria uh, are naturally resistant to some antibiotics. And an example of that is an organism called a bacteria called Pseudomonas. It lives in the environment, it tends to cause infections in uh, patients who are immunosuppressed or who are on critical care, for example, it can it can live in, in damp uh, places in, in the environment and uh, it's very difficult to treat because it's resistant naturally to antibiotics. But even if they're not uh, inherently resistant, oh dear. can you still hear me? Yes, we can still hear you. Oh good, I seem to have got funny message. Right, okay, so hopefully it's all okay. Yeah, the slides are back up, thank you. Oh, good. Uh, mutations. So these are spontaneous genetic changes that happen at random. 
um, all the time. So bacteria can start off uh, sensitive to antibiotics, then they multiply by the billions very quickly, and a few of them will randomly mutate and will randomly become resistant to an antibiotic. And if you treat them with, if you treat that patient with antibiotics, uh, the sensitive ones will all be killed off, but the resistant ones, the ones that have randomly acquired mutations that make them resistant will survive and multiply and thrive and they will become dominant in that patient. So that's um, mutations and mutations are basically, this is a Darwinian survival of the fittest. And that's uh, evolution happening uh, almost in front of our eyes. And then the last way that bacteria can become resistant is uh, by gene transfer. And this is um, a particularly uh, worrying way that, anti that um, bacteria become antimicrobial resistant. Uh, they can acquire resistant genes from other bacteria. And that can happen in different ways. It can happen by a process called transduction. And that thing that looks a bit like a spaceship on the bacterium on the left is, is a thing called a phage. And a phage is a virus that infects bacteria. So even bacteria can catch viruses and phages can transfer genes between different bacteria. Another process is transformation. Transformation is where bacteria just pick up bits of DNA that are floating around in, in the environment, usually after other organisms have died. And some bacteria are very good at this. And if they come across a piece of DNA from another bacterium, they can take it up and incorporate it into their own genome. That's called transformation. And the third way is by a process called conjugation. And in conjugation, bacteria, live bacteria can actually swap genetic material. And they particularly do that with these little structures called plasmids, which you may have heard of. Plasmids are extra chromosomal genetic elements. So there are they're little loops of DNA that are separate from the main chromosome of the bacterium that can be passed between organisms. And this is a particular problem because plasmids often carry resistant genes to more than one antibiotic. So often just by the single act of acquiring a plasmid, a bacterium can become resistant to several antibiotics all in one fell swoop. So um, in, in my um, modules on the BSc courses in uh, Applied Medical Sciences and Medical Pharmacology, uh, we go into more detail and we explore the mechanisms by which uh, these, these genetic changes cause antibiotic resistance. So we go into that in a lot more detail and the, the different biological mechanisms that happen in the cell. In the medical and uh, physician associate courses, uh, we look at antibiotic prescribing in more detail. Normally, when we prescribe any drug, we are constantly balancing up the uh, likely benefit to the patient against the toxicity to the patient. So it's always a risk benefit um, analysis of whether we should make a prescription of any drug because all drugs potentially may have uh, side effects. But when we're prescribing antibiotics, it's more complicated because we also have to consider the risk to the population from uh, generating antimicrobial resistance. So we have to think of our future patients as well as our current patients. And this makes antimicrobial prescribing uh, particularly difficult, un uniquely difficult, really, in medicine. And it's something that um, I spend quite a lot of time uh, talking to the medical students and the physician associate students about. So if, if you're interested to learn more about antimicrobial resistance, there's a really good website called Antibiotic Guardian, where there are all sorts of uh, resources and information at different levels for you to have a look at. There's also this film, which is called Catch. This was made ooh, four or five years ago now uh, by a creative film company. It describes uh, a, a not too distant future in which uh, we have major problems with antibiotic resistant uh, infections. But actually, as you can see from the picture, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, it suddenly seems a little bit more real. And the, on that, web, that's a 15 minute film, so it's not too long, but there's also on that website, there are some good clips of scientists talking about 
um, antimicrobial resistance. And um, for now, for a quick look at the online resources that I've developed to support uh, my students in Swansea on all my modules, uh, my website here is antibioticaware.com and you're welcome to go to it if you like and have a look around and see what I've put there. You'll find that I've uh, put all sorts of resources on there, including a series of revision videos I created called One Minute Micro, uh, some lecture notes, um, games such as antibiotic top trumps and bingo games and all the videos also available on a YouTube channel. So uh, all our students are able to access all this material. And I also use the website um, for the AWARE network, which is a network of healthcare professionals working in health boards across Wales who are undertaking education on antimicrobial resistance for other healthcare staff and public engagement. So um, I also host that material on the website. And I like to get uh, my students involved in some of the work of AWARE. Uh, and for the last two years, I've offered student projects on some of the aspects of this work. Uh, last year, my project student was able to present his work at the National Student Antimicrobial Resistant Conference uh, as a poster. Here's his poster. Um, and this year, I've got a student working on, on similar uh, project. Another initiative that I'm Oops, that I'm involved with is the International Collaborative of Pathologists. Uh, this is a really global initiative with a committee made up of members from the UK, Australia, India, the US. And this year I've got two third year project students carrying out a schools project for the International Collaborative of Pathologists, looking at uh, school pupils' understanding of careers in laboratory medicine and how the pandemic might have uh, affected their, their knowledge of that. I'd like to find ways for my students to link in with wider work, not necessarily only confined to the university setting. Um, for uh, one example is the Royal College of Pathologists National Pathology Week, which happens every November, and World Antibiotic Awareness Week. Uh, this was an event I ran for the Royal College of Pathologists at Swansea Science Festival a couple of years ago uh, before the pandemic. Uh, to celebrate the NHS's 70th birthday and I had students involved in that too and that was good fun. So I think I'll stop there, that's pretty much all that there's time to, to fit into comfortably to this session and thank you for listening. Uh, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions that, that you may have. So I'll stop sharing now and see if anyone wants to ask anything. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Davis. So just before we open up to um, live questions with those that are joining us live on the webinar this evening, I'm just going to bring the recording a second to a close and we will upload this onto the um, website of our webinar series. So just to remind those that are watching this back, if you do have questions, please get in touch with us and the email address as we said earlier to use is study at Swansea dot ac dot uk that'll come through to myself or the team um within our marketing recruitment team and we can make sure those emails are sent over to dr davis and we can get anything um any of those questions answered so i'll just end the recording